Let us pray. Our understanding of your word comes from you, O God. Open our ears and our minds and our hearts to hear what you would have to say to us. Help us upon hearing to understand and upon understanding to act. In Jesus' name, amen. Reading from the Gospel according to John. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I'm going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you open a red letter edition of the New Testament, the color red used for the words attributed directly to Jesus, you will see red letters everywhere in this portion of John. It's a four chapter section that biblical scholars call Jesus' farewell discourse. The setting is the dinner table where Jesus and the disciples have gathered for the Last Supper. Jesus has not directly said to them that it would be their last meal together, but surely they know the situation is grave. After all, the religious authorities are closing in on Jesus. His parting words begin in earnest right after Judas leaves the room to betray him. And he finishes them right before heading out to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he will be arrested. What was Jesus going to say to his closest friends? to those he had called together and taught and lived with and traveled and prayed with every day for three years, those who needed a word of assurance. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. A closer translation of the Greek is trust into God. Trust also into me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. Where I am, you may be, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I'm going. It's no wonder that we hear these words most often as a funeral or a graveside service of a loved one. Folks draw great comfort from them. And you would think the disciples would have drawn comfort too, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Thomas interrupts those red letter words of Jesus by saying, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus replies, I am the way and the truth and the life. You don't need a diagram or a Google map, just this intimate, unbreakable, confusing relationship that's been with you the past three years, Thomas, and is right here in front of you now. The way the truth, and the life. One commentator writes, in John, Jesus imbo himself embodies the way to God and therefore the way of discipleship. 
Jesus is the truth, the embodiment, the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And the entire purpose of Jesus's mission was to bring life to the world, participation in the very being of God. I am the way and the truth and the life. And then come words that perhaps have been misused more than any other passage of scripture through the centuries. No one comes to the Father except through me. Those words have been the justification for crusades, for inquisitions, for holy wars, and more, all in the name of Jesus. As one preacher puts it, Christians have misused that one phrase to draw lines in the sand rather than expand the circle of God's love. We've used it to exclude and then blame those we've excluded for not fitting in with our particular understanding of God. And we just don't get to do that. Amy Dickinson is a best-selling author and the advice columnist for Ask Amy. Here's a portion of a letter that she received recently. Dear Amy, every fall, my sister and cousins have a shopping excursion. We stay in a hotel, shop for our children, and go out for lunches and dinners. We do not invite my sister, Wendy. She's offended to the point of tears when she finds we have not invited her. My two sisters and I are very close in age, but Wendy hasn't been as close to this set of cousins as my sister and I have been through the years. We're all married, stay-at-home moms. Wendy is a divorced working mom with one young child. There's several reasons we don't include her. We know she doesn't have very much money. She also does not have many of the same interests as we do. Her life is quite different from ours. We're not interested in what she has to talk about. She complains too much about her aches and pains, which she uses to avoid getting up for church on Sundays. We're all very active churchgoers. Plain and simple, she does not really fit in with us anymore. She takes it very personally. Now she barely speaks to me and has told our relatives that I am a horrible person, even though I've helped her. How can we get her to understand that she should perhaps find another set of friends whose lives and interests align more closely with hers? Signed, Sad Sister. And Amy responds, Dear Sad, First, let's establish that I agree with your sister. You are a horrible person. (laughs) Obviously, you can do whatever you want and associate with or exclude whomever you want, but you don't get to do this and also blame the person you are excluding for not fitting in. The only way your sister would ever fit in would be for you to make room for her. You're unwilling to do that, and that's your choice. But her being upset is completely justified, and you'll just have to live with that. Perhaps this is something you could ponder from your church pew because despite your regular attendance, you don't seem to have learned much. (laughs) You don't get to exclude folks and then blame them for not fitting in. Maybe you've heard the story of the two drivers that were waiting at a traffic light. The light turned from red to green, but the first driver was looking down at something and, and didn't move. So the second driver waited fairly patiently until traffic began passing around them, so the second driver tapped on the horn to get the first driver to move, but it didn't work. Second driver ramped up the protest, yelling and pounding the steering wheel, nothing. The light turned yellow and the second driver went from tapping the horn to just flat laying on it while calling that first driver everything in the book. And then, just like that, the first driver looked up saw that the light was yellow, so that first driver hit the accelerator and sped through the intersection just as the light turned red. First driver made it through, but the second driver didn't. To say that second driver was an unhappy camper would be the understatement of the year. The car continued to rock back and forth with the waves of anger. It's amazing that the driver even heard the tap on the window. A police officer was standing there with weapon drawn. The driver did everything the officer commanded, which included turning off the engine and getting out of the car. The driver was cuffed, taken to headquarters, fingerprinted, booked, placed in a cell. A Couple of hours later, the same driver unlocked the cell and walked the driver back to the booking desk. 
I sincerely apologize for the mistake, the officer said, returning the driver's belongings. I pulled up behind you as you were laying on your horn, pounding your fists in the air and cussing a blue streak at that driver in front of you. At the same time, I noticed the what would Jesus do and the follow me to Sunday school bumper stickers on your car, as well as the Christian fish emblem on the trunk. And so naturally, I assumed that you had stolen someone else's car. <laughs> One of my seminary professors, Shirley Guthrie, had a wonderful way of boiling down big theological issues into a helpful nutshell. And he surmised that when Christians hear, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, they take that to mean that if Jesus is the only way to salvation, Christianity is the only true religion. And that has led far too frequently to exclusiveness and arrogance and intolerance. Perhaps, he said, perhaps we need to remember that this Jesus who says, I am the way, is also the one who says, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. This Jesus who says, I am the way, is also the one who ate with tax collectors and sinners. This Jesus who says, I am the way, is also the one who said, if you love me, feed my lambs. The one who seemed to believe that caring for needy, hurting, suffering human beings is a whole lot more important than doctrinal purity and theological orthodoxy. Thing is, from all indications, Jesus was not aiming to set up an exclusive my religion trumps your religion empire that night before his arrest. His focus was very immediate and very intimate. His full attention was on that small group of 11 around the table, that circle of friends with whom he had shared life and who now needed assurance that everything was going to be okay. His words were for them. Their hearts were troubled. His heart was most likely breaking. And so when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, he was using love language, as it's been called. He did not mean, it's the end of the line, boys. Goodbye and good luck out in that dog-eat-dog -dog world. He said, you're on the right track, dearest friends. You've made the right choice. No one can lead you to God better than I can. I am the way and the truth in the life that will lead you home, and you know the way home because you've seen that home in me. Jesus' words of love were meant to be those of promise, not a declaration of prohibition. And when John wrote his gospel account decades later, it was to those who believed in the risen Christ, those followers of the way, who also needed reassurance in those early days of persecution, days when young Christians like Stephen were being stoned for proclaiming their faith in a way that differed from the powers that be. The bottom line here is one commentator writes, in the grand scheme of faith, it's a mistake of enormous proportions to turn an embrace into a battering ram. A few years ago, we had a theological dust-up in the Presbyterian Church about this issue. The question was whether one could be saved outside of Jesus Christ. General Assembly even commissioned a study paper called Hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, and here's how that paper expresses it. For us, salvation is found in Jesus Christ alone, but, but we do not know the limits of God's grace. We do not know the limits of God's grace. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust into God. Trust also into me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. They were words shared by Jesus to the eleven during an intimate dinner conversation. There were words written by a gospel writer for those early believers in Jesus who needed reassurance of the deepest kind. And there are words to us today, words of reassurance for our relationship with God. And there are words of invitation to those who do not or struggle to believe 
They're words of invitation. They're words of love. There's a place for you. <clears throat> Kathleen Norris is a Presbyterian and a poet who's long been associated with the Benedictine community. In one of her books, Amazing Grace, she shares a story she learned from a Benedictine nun. The nun's mother was in the hospital and not doing very well. In fact, she was not expected to live much longer. So the nun was keeping vigil at her mother's bedside. At one point, she tried to comfort her mother by saying, Mother, remember, in heaven, everyone we love is there. The nun's mother looked at her daughter and offered a slightly different perspective. No, her mother replied, in heaven, I will love everyone who's there. May it be so.